Today, the Senate's expected to vote on a sweeping election reform bill. Democrats say it would protect voting rights, but Republicans say it would be federal overreach. It's unlikely to get the 10 Republican votes it needs to move forward. Here's NTD's Jessica Beatty with more. The Senate voting Tuesday whether to advance Democrats' sweeping election reform and voting bill. It's called the For the People Act. It's not a vote on this bill or that bill. It's a vote on whether the Senate should simply debate the issue of voting rights, the crucial issue of voting rights in this country. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer says it's in response to voting laws in Republican-led states, which he called an attack on the right to vote. But the top Senate Republican disagrees on what's behind the push. They've made abundantly clear that the real driving force behind S-1 is a desire to rig the rules of American elections permanently, permanently in Democrats' favor. Republicans are united against the bill, so it's unlikely to pass since it needs at least 10 Republican votes. The Senate will give this disastrous proposal no quarter. The bill would expand voter registration, require 15 days of mail-in and early voting, and limit states from removing voters from voter rolls. Last week, Democrat Joe Manchin proposed a compromise to try to get bipartisan support. It included voter ID requirements, at least 50 days of early voting, making states send absentee ballots to eligible voters, and making Election Day a public holiday. Last week, progressive Democrat Stacey Abrams supported his proposal on CNN. What Senator Manchin is putting forward are some basic building blocks that we need to ensure that democracy is accessible no matter your geography. But it didn't get GOP support. Republican Roy Blunt said it became the Stacey Abrams substitute instead of the Joe Manchin substitute. On Monday, White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki acknowledged that the vote will likely fail. It's a step forward. Uh, we don't expect there to be a magical 10 votes. I'm not suggesting that. But just two weeks ago, there were questions about whether Democrats uh, would be aligned. We certainly hope that will be the case tomorrow. She said if the bill is unsuccessful, they suspect it will prompt a new conversation about the path forward. Jessica Beatty, NTD News. A judge delays ruling on a high-profile election case in Fulton County, Georgia. Plaintiffs in the case want a forensic examination of ballots after multiple people say they witnessed fraud there. Lawyers for Fulton County are seeking to have the case dismissed. Henry County Superior Court Judge Brian Amaro delays ruling on a high-profile case involving the 2020 presidential election in Georgia. Amaro says, I think it's important that I take a little bit of time to review it and think about it. Fulton County became a focus of controversy in the 2020 election. Multiple people signed sworn affidavits alleging they witnessed fraud and irregularities in the election process there. Some examples include video evidence showing workers counting ballots in the middle of the night after poll watchers were told counting had finished, and a witness describing stacks of mail-in ballots that couldn't have been in envelopes because they weren't folded. An election observer sent by the Secretary of State's office described chaos and confusion in the Fulton County election process. That office is now investigating missing forms from ballot drop boxes. Plaintiffs in the case are seeking a forensic examination of the absentee ballots in Fulton County. Lawyers for Fulton County argued that the plaintiffs don't have standing. Fulton County election officials say they are being targeted by people who refuse to accept the results of the election. Amero gave the plaintiffs access to ballot images, but the resolution was too low for them to examine. A preliminary investigation showed approximately 30 batches of the ballots were double counted. Amero then ruled to allow the plaintiffs to see the physical ballots and get higher resolution images. Fulton County lawyers then filed a series of objections. Amero hasn't said when he will issue a ruling. The police commissioner in Springfield, Massachusetts, is praising her officers for using restraint during an incident with an armed man on Sunday. Police released this surveillance video showing 43-year-old Jose Montanez with a gun. They say he fired the weapon numerous times at bystanders. Technology called ShotSpotter is what alerted police. Then crime analysts used surveillance video to relay Montanez's location to officers. When officers arrived, they say Montanez began to run. But he's seen in the footage turning around multiple times and pointing his gun at officers. 
K-9 officers noticed the suspect's gun slide was locked in the rear, which means it's unable to fire or is out of ammunition. Montanez allegedly dropped the stolen gun at a high school before he was arrested. Officers recovered a second magazine in Montanez's waistband. No one was hurt. Montanez is facing multiple charges. You may have heard that police departments are struggling with manpower after the pandemic and anti-police activism. We take a look at the situation in the top three departments in the country. And it is Christina Kim with what you need to know. New York City has the largest police agency in the country, and the department spokesperson tells the Epic Times they're down about 1,500 officers. Retirements jumped from 1,500 in 2019 to 2,600 in 2020. That's as New York State outlawed officers from using a knee on a suspect's back or chest as a restraint tactic. Officers and experts criticize the move, saying it will actually make things more dangerous. The Chicago Police Department is also struggling. Data from the department shows it lost around 700 officers since 2019. But they're also struggling to recruit new officers. In 2019, they hired 459 officers. In 2020, they only hired 157. The police union president told the Epic Times the main sources of tension are a lack of respect for the force, salary disputes, and excessive workload. The president of the Chicago Police Sergeants Association says the force is short of 100 sergeants. On top of that, they're asked to supervise as many as 25 to 35 officers and work long hours with no days off. Moving over to the West Coast, Los Angeles had nearly 600 officers leave since 2019. That's largely due to a government hiring freeze during the pandemic and the city's decision to cut the budget by $150 million amid calls to defund the police. This, as the city saw a near 40 percent increase in shootings from 2019 to 2020. And as of June 12th, shootings are up nearly 60 percent from this time last year. Christina Kim, NTD News. Nebraska is sending troops to the U.S.-Mexico border to help law enforcement there. Governor, Governor Pete Ricketts made the announcement on Saturday. And it is Christina Kim has more details. Shortly after the governors of Arizona and Texas asked 48 states for help at the U.S.-Mexico border, Florida answered their calls. Now, Nebraska is joining in. On June 19th, Governor Pete Ricketts announced Nebraska will send around 25 State Patrol troopers to Del Rio, Texas, later in June. They're going to Del Rio possibly because their Border Patrol sector has seen a significant surge of migrants in recent months. The troopers will partner with the Texas Department of Public Safety, and the deployment will last no longer than 16 days. This comes as more than 50 House Republican lawmakers are calling on President Biden to replace VP Harris as the border czar. They note she has yet to visit the border and say 180,000 encounters and a 21-year high at the border is unacceptable. Harris said she would visit the border in the future and said she is addressing the root causes of the crisis. Typically, only federal officers under Border Patrol or ICE can detain people for immigration offenses. But because Governors Abbott and Ducey declared a disaster and an emergency, state police can make arrests in their states. Ricketts said the disastrous policies of the Biden-Harris administration created an immigration crisis at the border and that Nebraska is stepping up to help Texas. Christina Kim, NTD News. The Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City will soon host an exhibition of the Medici family. The exhibit will include over 90 pieces of art crafted during the Italian Renaissance. NTD's Jason Perry went to the Met Museum to find out more. The exhibition is not yet open to the public, but the press was able to get a sneak preview of the new Medici art exhibit. All of the artwork was commissioned between 1512 and 1570. This picture here was painted by Raphael. The Medici family attained their wealth when they funded the Medici Bank, which became the largest bank in Italy. Art critic William Newton related the significance of the Medici family to modern times. You can compare them to whatever sort of suddenly rich family in America that you want to. The Kardashians, the Trumps, um, you name it, people who became very famous and very rich very fast um, and essentially bought their way into society. There were also four Medici popes. The Medici family influenced the Renaissance period as they were patrons of Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, Galileo, and others in the arts and sciences, as they became wealthy and established democratic families. 
According to Newton, this is when the family started to develop expensive tastes and acquired more lavish clothing and accessories. This is reflected in some of the artwork. They don't necessarily give you a lot of um, psychological insight into the person in a way that we might expect from a modern portrait. A lot of times it's to show, look how much this suit cost. Look how much this dress cost. Look how many jewels I have. If this family was around today, they may have been seen taking selfies on social media. Just normal people who don't necessarily know a lot about art, but who understand how our celeb kind of culture works and you know, people getting endorsement deals and people sort of having millions and millions of dollars for doing nothing other than TikTok videos. This is kind of where that all started. The Medici exhibit will be open here at the Metropolitan Museum of Art from June 26th until October 11th. Jason Perry, NTD News, New York. The Sheriff's Office in Tular County, California, arrested a 34-year-old man. His crime, stealing 42,000 pounds of pistachios. The Touchstone Pistachio Company requested police investigate the theft last week after the company realized the pistachios were missing. Investigative leads in Fresno and Kern County discovered a tractor trailer containing the pistachios had moved from a trucking lot in Delano to another lot nearby. Detectives found the pistachios were being moved from 2,000-pound sacks into smaller bags and being resold. The Touchstone Pistachio Company got the remaining pistachios back. Alberto Montemayor was booked in Tular County. And Lake Mead has sunk to its lowest level ever, underscoring the gravity of the extreme drought across the west. And today's Andrew Thomas has the story. Bleached white embankments surround the Hoover Dam, an engineering marvel that symbolized American preeminence in the 20th century. The markings reveal how far the water level has fallen from its usual level, the largest reservoir in the United States. It's crucial to the water supply of 25 million people, including in cities like Los Angeles, San Diego, Phoenix, Tucson, and Las Vegas. We're in the 22nd year of drought, and the lake was about 95% full in year 2000, and now we're at 35%. The Hoover Dam generates hydroelectric power that serves 1.3 million people in Nevada, Arizona, and California. The Bureau of Reclamation, which manages water resources in western states, says the drought has been going on for 22 years. That's the driest period in the agency's 115 years of record keeping. According to paleoclimatologist Matthew Lockneat, this critical situation was somewhat expected. Lake Mead essentially acts like a bank account. There's water that's flowing in and then there's water that's flowing out for agriculture and for energy production. And the demands uh, on water outflows from Lake Mead are, are relatively well constrained. Uh, so the decrease in the water level in Lake Mead is, is mostly a human phenomenon in the sense that we're taking out more water than is flowing in and we do know that. While the low water level is concerning, it shouldn't discourage tourists from visiting the 115-mile man-made lake. The lake is still seeing a record number of visitors. Lake Mead is a huge lake, so to, to think that because the water level's down, this lake isn't a good boating lake is wrong. This lake is a wonderful boating lake. That's why it's one of the most visited parks in the national park system. The drought affecting Lake Mead has gripped California, the Pacific Northwest, and the Great Basin, spanning Nevada, Oregon, and Utah. Southwestern states Arizona and New Mexico, and even part of the Northern Plains, are facing the impacts as well. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. A landmark decision in Hong Kong today. Hong Kong's Court of Appeal is denying a trial by jury to the first person charged under the new national security law. It marks a departure from Hong Kong's common law tradition. In a landmark decision in Hong Kong, the Court of Appeal has upheld a ruling to deny a trial by jury to the first person charged under a new national security law. The ruling marks a departure from the global financial hub's common law practice. The lawyer for Tong Ying Kit appealed after a ruling last month, said he would face a trial without jury, citing a perceived risk of the personal safety of jurors and their family members. Police say Tong carried a sign reading, Liberate Hong Kong, Revolution of Our Times, and drove his motorbike into officers during a protest on July 1st. They allege he knocked several officers down on a narrow street before falling over and being arrested. It was the first day the security law that Beijing imposed on the city was in force. 
targeting what China deems as secession, separatism, terrorism and collusion with foreign forces. The 24-year-old was charged with inciting separatism and terrorism. Hong Kong's judiciary describes trial by jury as one of the most important features of the city's legal system, a common law tradition designed to offer defendants additional protection against the possibility of authorities overreaching their power. Article 46 of the new law, drafted by Beijing, states three instances in which juries can be scrapped, protecting state secrets, cases involving foreign forces and protecting jurors' safety. Tong has also been denied bail. Under the new law, the burden is now placed on the defendant to prove they will not break the law if released on bail. The trial is due to start on Wednesday. And a top Chinese spy has reportedly defected to the U.S. Some sources say that he passed on important information about the origin of the virus, names of Chinese spies in the U.S., and more. And today's Tiffany Meyer reports. Rumors are circulating that China's top spy catcher has defected to America. According to Chinese and English language media outlets, the intelligence he brought may shed light on the origin of the pandemic. Both U.S. and Chinese officials have stayed silent so far. NTD cannot independently verify the details. But conservative media Red State and intelligence news site Spy Talk claim they've confirmed from separate sources that the Chinese man's name is Dong Jingwei. Dong is vice minister of China's Ministry of State Security. That's Beijing's intelligence security and secret police agency. Chinese state media reports that he's responsible for the ministry's counterintelligence efforts, that is, to catch spies. According to Red State, Dong fled to the U.S. in February and has been working with the Defense Intelligence Agency, or DIA, for months. The agency is part of the Department of Defense and the U.S. intelligence community. He's reportedly submitted critical information to DIA that includes the Chinese regime's early studies about the CCP virus, known as COVID-19. Models predicting virus spread and its potential damage to the U.S. and the world, as well as the names of Americans who provide intelligence to the Chinese regime and names of Chinese spies working in the U.S. He also claimed the Chinese regime has gained access to a CIA communication system, leading to the deaths of more than 10 Chinese people who had worked with the CIA. On June 18th, just days after news about Dong's defection, China's state-controlled media reported that he had spoken at a seminar on Friday. But unlike standard news articles, the report did not mention where the seminar took place, nor did it contain any photos of Dong. It also claimed that at the seminar, Dong cautioned Chinese spies to watch out for moles who work with foreign forces. Speaking to Radio Free Asia, former U.S. diplomat Matthew James Brazil said the Chinese regime published the piece in an attempt to debunk the rumor. He took special notice of the lack of a photo, saying if he were Beijing, he would have at least added a picture of Dong to show that he's still in China. The story has caused heated debate. Senior member of the Republican National Committee, Solomon Yu, is now betting his committee see that the rumors are true. He had told the Chinese language media that he had confirmed the news from what he called a reliable source. Dong's intel about the Chinese regime's infiltration into the CIA fell in line with a New York Times article from 2017. The newspaper reported that between 2010 and 2012, Beijing deconstructed the CIA's operations in China by killing or jailing over a dozen of the agency's sources in the country. One of them was reportedly shot in a government courtyard in front of his colleagues to send a message to other CIA informants. At the time, some U.S. investigators suspected that China may have hacked the CIA's covert system, used talk with foreign sources. Other reports also suggest Beijing's infiltration into the CIA. In May 2019, then-CIA officer Kevin Patrick Mallory was charged with spying for China. He was later sentenced to 20 years in prison. In November of the same year, another officer, Li Jinchen, admitted to providing secret intelligence to Beijing. He was sentenced to 19 years. China will likely face a dilemma over the origins of the CCP virus. That's according to U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan. He told Fox News in an interview on Sunday that China will face isolation if it does not cooperate with probes into the origins of the virus. 
either they will allow uh, in a responsible way investigators in to do the real work of figuring out where this came from or they will face isolation in the international community. The origins of the CCP virus remain a mystery even after almost two years. A team led by the World Health Organization or WHO spent four weeks in and around Wuhan with Chinese researchers earlier this year. In its report, the team claimed that the virus probably transmitted from bats to humans. And that introduction through a laboratory incident was extremely unlikely. But experts said some data have been withheld. And the U.S. mission to the U.N. said in a statement last month that the WHO study was insufficient and inconclusive. Sullivan says the U.S. won't count on China to find out about the virus origins without external pressure. It is that diplomatic spade work rallying the nations of the world, imposing political and diplomatic pressure on China. He says the Biden administration will cooperate with the intelligence community and allies to press the matter on every front until they find a result. But in another interview with CNN, Sullivan says the current administration will not apply any immediate CP over the matter. Last month, President Biden ordered aides to find answers to the origins of the virus. He said they will be looking at rival theories, including the lab leak theory. But Beijing claimed that the issue will hamper investigations. In France's Versailles, there is a garden where Queen Marie Antoinette is said to have enjoyed walking. A secluded place where she had the idea to create a signature floral perfume. Entity's David Vives has a story. Versailles and Bloom. Summer is a perfect time to visit the castle gardens. One this place was built for Queen Marie Antoinette to have somewhere secluded to walk away from the noise of the castle and the king's court. The size of the leaves, the size of the leaves, the different flowers colors and the moment when they bloom, even the different tones of green. According to Sionpini, the garden is crafted following French traditions. It offers little surprises to whoever walks along the way and also shows a taste for symmetry and balance in the placement of the plants. The garden reopened along with the castle and both are welcoming the first summer visitors who can enjoy a calm castle before most tourists start coming back. David Dives, NTD News, Paris. A Japanese architect is following his father's footsteps by designing the aquatic center for the Tokyo Olympics this year. His father was one of the world's most famous architects of the 20th century and the designer of the swimming venue for the 1964 Tokyo Olympics. 63-year-old Japanese architect Paul Noritaka Tange is carrying on his father's legacy after winning the rights to design the aquatic center for the 2020 Tokyo Olympics. His father, Kenzo Tange, was a revolutionary architect who designed the swimming venue for Asia's first Olympics in Tokyo in 1964. I wanted to tell my father that I had grown enough to do this. I believe we're the only father and son in the world to design the same Olympics venue, and a strong feeling of respect for my father is also part of the reason why I wanted to do it. Upon completing his studies in Switzerland and at Harvard, the young architect joined his father's firm in 1985. For decades, the two worked and built together. He says his father was a workaholic, often late for dinner. When we were at meals, all the talk was about architecture. Through this kind of experience, I started to feel like it's natural to become an architect. The bold floating roof inspires the father designed for the 1964 games evoke Japanese temples and suspension bridges. They serve as a symbol of Japan's triumphant return to the world stage after the defeat in World War II. But this year, as the country comes under pressure from the economic downturn and the pandemic, reuse and sustainability become the mantras for the son's design. For the new venue, he combines principles he learned from his father with lines reminiscent of a bamboo. Gradually, I came to see my father as the master, and I never have seen him as a rival. My father was a mentor to me, so I think it's difficult to exceed him. The father was also the designer of Japan's Hiroshima Peace Museum and the Tokyo Metropolitan Government Building. He died in 2005 at age 91. And that's it for now. You can catch us again tonight at 6.30 Eastern. I'm Evelyn Lee.